So let's try a little bit of word association. If I say the word shepherd, then what comes to your mind? You know, for most of us, it's going to be Bethlehem, the Christmas story, the shepherds who were watching their flocks in the field, and the angels appeared and told them about the birth of Messiah, and they went into Bethlehem, and they saw the Christ child. I mean, the shepherds of Bethlehem. We don't know their names, but they're probably the most famous shepherds in the Bible. But you know, they're not the only shepherds in the Bible. Fact is, in the Old Testament, there are many characters that are part of the stories, and they were shepherds. At least they started as shepherds, and then they went on to do the great things that they did. So, yeah, there's a lot of shepherds that we could talk about. So, in this month, I want to introduce you to one of those Old Testament shepherds. We're going to be talking about Amos. We're going to do a sermon series. It's on the book of Amos. We'll look at the book, the message, and, of course, the man himself and see what we can learn about Amos and what he had to say and, and how that relates to us today as we take his, his teachings and then figure out what it is you and I need to do with that. And so we'll take a good look at the prophet Amos. Now, I'm going to introduce him to you today, and, and it's with a message I've entitled, The Shepherd of Tekoa. We'll start in chapter 1 verse 1, as Amos introduces himself to us. Here's what he says. It says, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. So, now he's given us his name. And, and, and as I think about his name, I think about the book that he wrote. I want to put it in its biblical perspective. So, let me remind you about the Old Testament prophets. And here I'm talking about prophets with the capital P. Those men to whom God gave visions and, and, and gave a message and then sent them out to preach that message to the people. And they preached those words, and then they wrote them down. They became scriptures, the Old Testament. We think about those prophets. They're divided into two categories. We often refer to them as the major and the minor. The major prophets, now that's the big books of the Old Testament written by some characters who really did a lot. We think, for example, of Isaiah. And then Jeremiah, who wrote two books, Jeremiah and Lamentations. Then there's Ezekiel and Daniel. Their books are big, many chapters, and, and we know a lot about their lives. But then we have the minor prophets. That's the tail end of the Old Testament. There's 12 books. They're all small. They're all by fellows we don't know much about. We don't get much bio. Now, their ministries were significant, but yet they are small to us by comparison to the major prophets. Now, in that list of the minor prophets, you got Hosea, Joel, Amos. Amos is number three. He's one of the early of the 12 minor prophets. Now, when did he begin his ministry? He tells us that in verse 1. He says, when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam was king of Israel. He refers to two historical characters we can read about in the book of Kings, the book of Chronicles. King Uzziah was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Think in the south, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, some of the famous towns you know. And then up north, we've got King Jeroboam II, named after a previous Jeroboam. And he's the king of the northern kingdom, the ten tribes that broke away. And, and there's a difference between these two kings and really between their people. Because King Uzziah is described in Kings and Chronicles this way, and he did right in the eyes of God. On the other hand, Jeroboam is described, and he did evil in the sight of God. Boy, that's the ministry of Amos. He's going to preach to two kings and to their people, one good and one bad, and, of course, everything in between. Isn't that typical what preachers do? We preach to you all. It doesn't matter who you are, and are you on the straight and narrow, have you gone astray? God's got a message for everyone, and we preach the word to all. And so Amos is going to preach to two kings, two people, two nations, a message from God. Now, in describing when he began his ministry, he also throws in one other historical detail, there in that verse 1, he says that his ministry began with a vision he received two years before the great earthquake. Now, you hear that phrase. That's kind of interesting, intriguing. In fact, it's a little ominous. Something called the great earthquake. Well, I'll tell you, something did happen, and they talked about it for a long time. Because you can go almost 300 years later to the prophet Zechariah. At the end of the Minor Prophets, chapter 14, he refers back to the great earthquake in the days of King Uzziah. Boy, that must have been some big earthquake. 
And archaeologists today, as they're digging in the Holy Lands and they're finding things, they've also put a date on that great earthquake based on what they see as the evidence in the ground. And they've dated it about 760 B.C. Well, that fits the the reigns of Uzziah and Jeroboam II. It fits what we know of Amos. And so, yeah, there was a great earthquake that took place. And two years before that is when Amos began his ministry. He began it with a vision from God. That's typical of all the prophets, really, that God would first speak to them. He'd speak to them, maybe a voice that would come and they could hear the voice, maybe something they see, a vision, maybe it'd be in a dream. But God always came and he called them to a task, told them where to go and what to say. It began with a vision. I point that out to you because prophets were not self-appointed. That is, you didn't just decide one day, I want to be a prophet, so yeah, I'm going to start doing it. No, no, no. You had to be called by God, and he would do that in a vision or a dream. Those other guys, the Scriptures call them the false prophets, the ones who just put themselves out there. But Amos is one of the appointed by God prophets. Now, speaking of that occasion when God came to him in a vision and, and called him to be a prophet, you know, you, you think he could have said no if he wanted to. I mean, yes or no, it, it's a question. So, yeah, you've got two possible answers. So, Amos, why did you choose to say yes to God and, and become a prophet of God? He'll tell you the why. Amos says in chapter 3, verse 8, the Lord God has spoken. What else could I do but prophesy? Boy, I like his spirit. What else could I do but prophesy? God spoke, and so, of course, I did it. He said he wanted me to preach. He told me to whom he wanted me and what he wanted me to say, and what am I going to tell God? No. I like his spirit. And that gives us a life principle you and I need to remember as well. When God speaks, do it. I put it simple so we both can remember it. When God speaks, whatever he says, let's do it. If he says, do this, or if he says, don't do that, it doesn't matter what he says. When God speaks in his word, then we should just simply do it. Now, while I see the spirit of Amos in that passage, I want to remind you of two other great prophets of God. You know their names, Moses, Jonah, and now Amos. Boy, how different those three were. When God called Moses, he's there at the burning bush. God says, I've got a job for you to do. Be a great prophet, great leader. You know what Moses said? I can't do that. I don't have the gift of speaking, and I can't get in public and face off with a Pharaoh. I, I can't do it. Jonah, when God called him to go preach the message of Nineveh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go to Nineveh, that pagan land, and I, I don't want to travel. I don't want to do any of that. Boy, you look at those three lined up side by side. Moses, I can't do it. Jonah, I won't do it. Amos, I must do it. The Lord God has spoken. What am I going to do? Say no, no. There's nothing else to do except do what God says do. Principle for me and you to apply to our life. When God speaks, do it. Now, speaking of God speaking, that voice that Amos heard in the vision, he describes what that voice sounded like in Amos chapter 1, verse 2. Here's what he describes. The Lord roars from Zion, and he thunders from Jerusalem. Now, he uses two images everybody will recognize and know exactly what he's talking about. The first image is the roar of a lion. You probably have heard it, especially if you've been to a zoo, but you can imagine if you've not heard it for live, and that is if you were standing in your backyard... And a few feet behind you, you heard the loud roar of a lion. You would know to freeze and be careful what you do next. Your next move could be trouble. Yeah, we know the roar of a lion. We also know what thunder sounds like as those thunderstorms will roll through here. And we're impressed with the lights and the sounds and the, the power of God, the creator displayed in creation. Yeah, we know about both of those. You know, you've been hearing in the news all about AI, artificial intelligence, and all the strange things that are going on. I'm not sure what I think about all of that, except that one aspect of it, I'm thinking it's pretty cool. And that's where you can tell the program, I, I want to give you a description. Let me fill in a few pieces, and then you give me a picture that has all of that in it. So imagine my surprise when you give it the, the description. I want the roar of a lion but I also want thunder as well. And, well, look at this picture. That's what you get. And I'm looking at this character, and I'm thinking, boy, if this guy spoke, it's going to get your attention. You're going to stop and listen to what he says. Well, I don't know about this guy. I do know about God. 
And this is what Amos reminds us. is a truth throughout the scriptures, and that is when God speaks, God speaks with great power. Now, you know, that has practical application for us. When God speaks, he speaks with great power because when he speaks, he is not giving us just mere suggestions of what we might consider doing. No, no, God speaks in a totally different way than that. You're hearing the commands of the king of creation. That's how God speaks. He speaks with great power, and you're not to take him lightly. Now, all through the scriptures, that kind of imagery is used for God time and time again. I think, for example, of the book of Revelation. Here's the apostle John taking his tour of heaven, just seeing all the grand sights in those visions of the book of Revelation. But here's what John often tells us throughout those chapters. He mentions how that when the Lord speaks, oh, the voice would be loud. How loud, you ask John? Oh, one time he'll describe it as like the blast of a trumpet. That's pretty loud. Or another time he may say like the roar of rushing water. Picture Niagara Falls. That's a deafening sound if you've ever been there. I have. Or he says, like the pales, peals of thunder. Yeah, he speaks of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, and they speak with voices that are power. And you know what John does every time? Oh, he'll mention it a couple of times where the, the voice comes at him, it comes loud, and what does John do? He falls to the ground. Oh, yeah, there's a little bit of terror in hearing the voice that's that loud. He'll fall to the ground. God speaks, and John falls to the ground. You know what I, you and I do? We fall asleep. If the preacher is preaching from the Word of God, but the sermon just seems to keep going on and on. He can't seem to find an ending and a place to land that plane. Before you know it, we're getting a little drowsy. We, we fall asleep. Or if we're reading the Scriptures, we're doing our chapter a day, as I've encouraged you to do. But it's getting a little tiring here. I'm in Leviticus. I'm in Chronicles. And maybe it's late at night and before you know it. I'm, my mind is drifting. I'm, I'm getting drowsy. Yeah, God speaks, but we're not feeling the power. Now, it might help. It might help if the presentation of the Word of God was more powerful. So, for example, it might help if the preacher would raise his voice and start yelling a little bit. Then I might could pay attention to the Word of God. Or maybe if our text, maybe if he printed it with all caps and some exclamation points, that might catch my attention. Yeah, I suppose we could do that. I think about Amos, the prophet. Now, he describes how when God spoke to him in the vision, how powerful it was, I wonder what kind of preacher Amos was as he went out to preach that message. Was he the type of preacher that's going to be pounding the pulpit and he's going to be yelling? Maybe. That might fit a good prophet. Was he rather the preacher that spoke in the style he's accustomed to, his own manner, and he just simply spoke it in a soft voice, but giving the message of God? I don't know which way Amos preached. Truth is, all through Christian history, we've had preachers with their different styles. I've got my own. Mine's kind of a soft approach. Others got one that's more energetic. But, you know, it's not really about the style of presentation. You may have your preference, your opinion. But when all is said and done, you know what the power is? It's not so much the volume of the voice. The power is in the message of God. The power is in His Word. And here's what I recommend. You listen to the power in the Word of God. When a preacher preaches and he uses the Scriptures, no matter how his voice may go and how he crafts his message, you be listening closely and feel the power that's in the Word of God. And when you're reading the Scriptures, doing your daily devotional, listen for the power in the Word of God. It's there. Oh, His Word always has great power. We just got to open up our ears and we'll hear it. I also want to encourage you to listen to the message in the Word of God, because it's not just simply about the power, a power that commands us to do what God wants us to do, but listen to what He actually says in that message. What does it He wants us to do? Now, Amos, as we go through his chapters, we'll get a taste of the message that God wanted him to preach to those people, but I'll take all the chapters. I'll sum up for you what the book of Amos is all about and what the preaching of Amos was. Number one, it always had an element of rebuke. Amos is in the business of calling out the sins of the people, calling them to task, stepping on their toes. And he will name names. He'll, he'll give you a list of things that you're doing that are wrong. You know, it's what preaching does because we're using the Word of God and God's Word is always telling us, don't do this, don't do that, and giving us our moral guidelines. So, yeah, when preachers use the Word of God, there's going to be some rebuking. Get ready for it because you and I need to hear it. 
There's also warning. And the book of Amos, he will warn them of judgment to come if you don't get back on the straight and narrow. One of the famous sermons is a little bit later in the book of Amos when he has the vision of the plumb line. You know, the string that's got the weight at the bottom. And an architect might use it as he lines it up to a wall because he wants to see if the wall is straight like it should be or if it's out of alignment. It's going to the side of the plumb line. Now, if it's straight, good. We'll sign off on that. If it's off, we'll tear it down and put up a new wall. God takes the plumb line. And he holds up against your life to see if you are measuring up to what he says in his word as he lays out the standard. And that's what preachers, that's what we have to give you. We got to line that plumb line up and and warn you if you're off, you're going to be gone. But there's also the word of encouragement. Amos is big on encouraging. Oh, he'll chew you out and then he'll come and encourage you. He has a famous phrase he'll use more than once. Seek the Lord and you will live and then he's got those beautiful prophecies of what the saints can anticipate when, when days go by if we stay true to God. Amos is a typical preacher, just like the Old Testament prophets, just like New Testament preachers, just like what you're used to hearing today. We, we need to hear the rebuke and the warning, and we need a word of encouragement. That's what Amos does. I want to go back to Amos one last time, that shepherd of Tekoa, as I call it, because that's what he describes himself. Amos says this about himself as a prophet. He's up here. He's preaching to two kings and their people, their nations. But you know what he has to say? Chapter 7, he says, now, I want you to understand, before this prophet gig, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. Now, first, I wasn't a prophet. Amos did not grow up wanting to be a prophet one day. No, no, he didn't have aspirations that direction. He's He's doing some other kind of business, but God called him to be a prophet. I wasn't really a prophet before. I am now. I wasn't the son of a prophet. We always think that means his dad wasn't a prophet. That's probably true. But actually that phrase, the son of the prophet, that's an Old Testament phrase. It refers to the school of prophets that we call it. That is, Elijah and Elisha and other great leaders, they would have young fellows that they would teach and mentor so that when a message came to Elijah, he could then send that message through these other young preachers and get that message out throughout the land. And so they were preachers. He was the big prophet. They were preachers. He said, I wasn't in one of those schools. Nobody trained me and taught me how to be a prophet. So, so Amos, where'd you come from? Amos says, I'm a shepherd. And I tend sycamore fig trees. Now, I'll start at the back there first. The the sycamore fig tree, that's all over the region where Amos is from. They're south of Jerusalem there in the land of Judah uh, from the little small village of Tekoa. Yeah, they they got plenty of those. And I used to take care of those. But also, he says, and I was a shepherd. We know the business of shepherds. They take care of sheep. And I'm from this little small town you've probably never heard of, Tekoa. And the truth is they would not have. It's just a small village. Now, think about that. Is that the credentials that would be respected if you're going to preach before kings and nations? Hardly. But, you know, that's who God called to be his prophet to those two kings and to their kingdoms. Because here's what God does. God calls ordinary people to do extraordinary things. You'll see that all through the Bible. God loves to take somebody who's rather ordinary, call him to a task, and with God's help and power, we're going to do some big things. Now, if you think about that as a principle, you'll see it throughout the Scriptures. And let me remind you, since we're focused on shepherds today, Amos wasn't your first shepherd that God called to a great task. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those three great men They were shepherds, as well as the 12 sons of Jacob that became the leaders of the 12 tribes. Or or we think in terms of Moses, the leader that took him out of Egypt. God called him at the burning bush as he was a shepherd. Or David, the great king who set the standard for all kings, but he started as the shepherd boy who watched the sheep while he wrote some psalms. And now we've met Amos. I was a shepherd. I tended sycamore fig trees, a shepherd and a farmer, and God called me to rise up and do this great task. Here's what God does. God calls ordinary people to come serve him. Hey, ordinary people like me and you. Yeah, we don't feel like any of the great guys, but listen, most of the great guys in the Scripture started as small, humble people that God called to serve. God's calling you to serve, to find a place of service 
in his church. Some of you already do. Some of you yet to get plugged in, but God calls us to rise up and serve him. And you say, I can't. I don't want to. You say all you want. But Amos says, if God speaks, you do it. How do you tell God no? You find a place of service, and God will empower you to do something good. I got to give you one last note here as I think about this shepherd of Tekoa, and that's this. And that is you and I today, as we are Christians in the church and Christians in our home as well, let me recommend that we be Christian shepherds. That is, that we take the idea of a shepherd and see if we can use that in the way we work with other people in whatever roles we, we are working. Now, the Scriptures do that for us quite a bit in the New Testament. It tells the leaders of the church, I want you to be like shepherds, whether you're elders or deacons or, 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 or the ministers or, or teachers, whatever. Time and time again, shepherd is used as the role model for all of us in our service and ministry in the church. And I would recommend you use that as you're working in the church, as you're working in your home, your community, wherever. Think like the way a shepherd thinks. What's that involve? You know the obvious. There's pastoral care. What does a shepherd do? Make sure the sheep are, are well-fed and well-watered. And so, as David said in the 23rd Psalm, well, he, he'll find the, the green pastures and the still water so I can eat and I can drink. And that's what you and I do. We're helping the people around us, feeding them with the Word of God, giving them good biblical guidance and counsel and such as that, trying to make them spiritually healthy. But there's also with the shepherd the spiritual protection, looking out for whatever lurks out there. Shepherd stands watch. Watches all around while the sheep are busy just eating. But he's watching for the wolf, the lion, or whatever's coming and try to scare them off. And that's what you and I do. We watch for all the false ideas that are out there in this world and, and, and give a caution to our people. Stay away from this. Stay away from that. That's, that's harmful. And likewise, the shepherd provides guidance. In our case, it would be biblical guidance. We know the shepherd's going to lead the sheep here, lead the sheep there. We take the lead as well. Using the Word of God, we try to lead our people around us to where they need to be in the eyes of the Lord. Whether it be here at church as you're working with youth or children or with the adults or whether it be at home dealing with your children, grandchildren, or among your friends, you're always trying to give that biblical guidance that helps people go the direction they need to go in their lives. Hey, bottom line is this. You want to learn a lesson from Amos, the shepherd of Tagoa? Think like a shepherd. As you are living your life each day, interacting with people, think like like a shepherd, and take advantage of all of those things that shepherds do as they try to help their flock become the best they can be. And let's see if you and I can do that as we work with people. And I do believe that God can take you and do something great through you if you're willing to rise up and, and answer His call. Because remember, God's in the business of calling ordinary people, even shepherds, and raising them up to do great things. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege we have to even be noticed by you, to be loved by you, to be saved by you through your Son. And Father, we're grateful for the opportunity we have to give something back in our lives and in our service. May we always be willing to step forward and say, if when God speaks, I'm going to do. And take advantage of the opportunities you put before us to do something for you, knowing that as we do for you, oh, you will empower us that good things can be accomplished in your name. We thank you, Father. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.